are welcoming you to our webinar to discuss Psalms 3RP Round 4. So this is a, um, the same presentation that we delivered um, through regional workshops recently. And uh, we're just taking this opportunity now to give you a webinar version. Um, we appreciate not everybody can make it to a regional workshop. So the format for today, um, we're going to run through the presentation itself and then there's opportunity at the end uh, just to run through answers to your questions. The way this works is you can submit your questions at any time throughout the presentation. What we do at our end is we just note them down and then we run through them. Um, we're also going to take a recording of the webinar so we can make the link available. Um, it will be sent to you directly and that way you can share it with your colleagues, etc. Again, trying to get to people who just can't make it to the webinar today. Um, we're also going to ask you to complete a really quick survey at the end. Um, we'll take about one minute of your time and this just helps us to develop uh, future webinars and, and ways of communicating. Okay, so today's webinar is your presenter is Ben Fee from Persa. So Ben has been um, involved with the Psalms program right from the start and um, it's here to talk to you today about round four. So there's contact details at the end of this presentation for the Psalms team if you need to get in touch directly. Um, but again, there's opportunities to ask questions throughout. So now I'm going to pass over to Ben and uh, he'll kick off the presentation on Psalms. Hello, thank you to everyone for hooking in today. A uh, good opportunity for us to deliver the message across to uh, those people who couldn't make it to the information sessions uh, which we delivered a couple of weeks ago up in the Riverland and down in the River Murray region uh, uh, around Murray Bridge and also uh, down into Langhorn Creek. Um, I'm just going to be going through the presentation a bit quicker than we go through during the sessions uh, out on the ground. Um, obviously a different form of interaction. So bear with me, I will flick through a few slides a bit quicker than we had previously, um, but that Q&A session at the end will hopefully give us a chance to uh, catch up on any questions that you might have that weren't clear. Uh, and there's always a chance to contact our regional support officers at any time to uh, further clarify anything that you have heard that um, hasn't been fully understood. So getting straight into it. Our, uh, South Australian River Murray Sustainability Program uh, is a $265 million program and it is really the irrigation industry improvement program element uh, which was driven through the Basin Plan, uh, which is the $240 million program that is to return 40 gigalitres of water uh, to the River Murray environment as part of South Australia's commitment to the Basin Plan. So you'll see on the, the right hand side of your screen uh, that we've got uh, number four there, Irrigation Industry Improvement Program. And it's been delivered through uh, three uh, investment streams. Uh, a, Irrigation Efficiency, which we had $80 million allocated to water returns uh, at $40 million and Irrigation Industry Assistance at $120 million. Uh, obviously we've been whittling away at that cash as we've gone through the previous rounds, one, two and three. To focus on these three streams, um, we've had available under irrigation uh, uh, efficiency, the on-farm and off-farm sort of more traditional irrigation efficiencies uh, opportunities. Um, but we've also offered through this program, the 3IP, um, a new suite of activities that could result in water savings. Uh, Primarily where we started was looking at the notion of changing crop types from a high water use crop to a low water use crop and also changing the configuration of those crops sometimes results in the water saving as well. Um, the industry has been innovative which has been fantastic and come back with a few new techniques as well and um, in particular netting has been something that we've seen uh, implemented through rounds one, two and three which uh, has actually resulted in some pretty significant water savings and productivity benefits. The water returns element, uh, which has been fully expended, um, which is uh, no longer available in our uh, round th round four, sorry, of the 3RP, um, just included a straight water purchase element. But what that meant was that whether you came in through our stream one or stream two, uh, you'd be returning water to the program. 
by returning water to the program, you would then have access to stream three. So you can have a full mix of all of these various um, streams, but you couldn't simply go for stream three, the irrigation industry assistance stream, without having returned water through either streams one and two. So once you're returning water through stream one and two, uh, you tick those boxes, in effect, you could enter into stream three, which really was where we focused on the business elements. And this was all developed up uh, in particular through the Water Industry Alliance and great work that was being done by industry um, around the development of the basin plan with state government. Water Industry Alliance made sure that um, the industry's interests were conveyed and they have definitely been conveyed through the 3RP. Uh, and it was really this stream three element, the irrigation industry assistance element uh, that brought life to the more business side uh, within South Australia, supporting business development and growth, noting that we're already a fairly uh, efficient state uh, in relative terms against the rest of the basin. So you can do all kinds of activities underneath this stream. Um, you can reconfigure your enterprise, you can go into new market areas. Um, we've seen some training and skills, but the biggest area that we've really seen uh, being developed is the value add uh, type of uh, area within the irrigation industry assistance. Like packing sheds, um, packing equipment, uh, cool rooms, those types of things have been really significant in this space. Um, plus, this provides a bit of extra funding to leverage the more expensive activities, such as netting. So moving on, um, we've made some pretty good progress throughout time uh, with our rounds. As you can see, pretty much on an annual basis, we've had a round available. And uh, rounds one, two and three uh, ultimately um, has resulted in the figures that you now see on screen. We've offered around $177 million um, out to 186 projects with some significant co-investment and jobs creation, which has resulted for us um, in uh, about 87%, just it's 87 and a half percent of our water return target having been met. So we're just under 35 gigalitres of water on offer to the program, um, returning to the environment out of our total 40 gig. We've gone right throughout the region uh, through rounds one and uh, two and three. And uh, you can see that there's a fair amount of, um, of projects that we deliver up around the Riverland region. It's about 80% of the projects, which actually kind of fits with the split that we've seen in water license volumes and also productivity between the Riverland area and the sort of below Lock 1, uh, so sort of Murray Lands areas. Um, so we have had a reasonable distribution of funding right throughout which has resulted in some pretty significant works uh, across a number of industries and uh, in particular with plantings, we've seen um, some real increases in uh, the traditionals. Uh, grapes have been quite interesting. We've seen um, a pulling out of the less marketable uh, varieties and uh, replacement with uh, more marketable varieties. Um, and we've had growth in a new, uh, a few new areas, um, Berries, for example, we've got some blueberries and the rest that have been put in, which is great. And obviously almonds have been uh, going gangbusters as well. So we've been happy to accelerate those various areas of industry. It's been an interesting story over time with the, the 3RP. Uh, the demand was extremely high in rounds one and two. And um, as I mentioned earlier, that we have now run out of that uh, stream two funding. That actually occurred in round two. So. Um, you'll see in the round two column there, uh, if you look at the reserve list number, we actually had 29 uh, reserve list projects that we weren't able to invite through to funding, just simply because they were looking for stream two and three funding, um, and we had run out of the stream two funding. At that stage, which was uh, around September, August, September of 2015, we did go back and seek for some flexibility in our funding model, and we weren't able to get that. So unfortunately, those projects um, we're not able to be funded. Uh, we um, then went to round three without our stream two funding available. Uh, and you can see a significant drop off um, in the amount of demand uh, with 41 odd expressions of interest for round three. What was also happening at the time though was some uncertainty around the allocations, uh, water allocations for that year. It started off at a, a low allocation and built uh, and there was also a change in the uh, the market ability, uh, market position, sorry, of a number of the commodities um, with some securing of those markets, which was positive, which meant that people uh, were perhaps less motivated to attend, uh, apply for a round three. Um, what we're seeing with round four at the moment, um, as we're just over halfway through the expression of interest period, is really significant interest, which has been great because we are saying it is the last round and it is the best value that we've ever had an offer. And you'll see in a slide coming up that, Despite the low number of round three participants, 
they actually had the best value in terms of dollars per megalitre out of any of the rounds. So our funding over time, just to give you a sense of where that funding was expended, um, really if you focus on the yellow elements in this graph, they're the round two uh, proposals that we received through and stream one, two uh, and three irrigation efficiency water returns and uh, the industry assistance uh, element. That was um, really uh, in round two, we expanded the water returns element, led us to around three where you can see in the green, you had less demand. But what you can see is the blue uh, is the remaining funding that we've got for round four, which is $37 million to achieve around five litres of water returns, which does result in a, a very high uh, water um, dollar per megalitre rate which we are happy to have on offer in the last round, the highest uh, amount that we've ever had. Um, in uh, terms of the water returns, you can see uh, once again, obviously the, the stream two, the water returns element, um, the volume of water that we could achieve, we've actually gone uh, right to the amount of water that we needed to achieve and a little bit beyond in water returns. You just see um, here that our target, we've actually gone just a bit above it in the, the right hand column there in the yellow. Um, that water has not been returned um, to the Commonwealth Government. That still sits with the states, considered to be state water. What that does is provide us a bit of an insurance policy going forward for how we might um, achieve our target if we don't uh, get what we need in round four. Um, and stream one, you can see the blue element is what we need to achieve um, under our current round, round four. And we would hope to achieve that. Uh, if we do end up achieving that and go a little bit beyond, um, we've worked with industry and uh, kept to the plan, uh, if you like, and made sure we delivered this in good faith. So if we do end up going beyond 40 gigalitres, we will make sure we go back to industry and say, hey, look, we've got some extra water here. What would we all like to do with this extra water? So that is a commitment we've always had and we will keep sticking to that. Just in terms of the dollars available over time, um, coffee, the dot on the right-hand side there, that's the Commonwealth On-Farm Further Irrigation Efficiencies Program. That's the rate that they currently have on offer. Um, in effect, uh, what we started off in round one was around $5,000 per megalitre um, was what people actually came at us with. Uh, we did have above that, we were saying it was about $5,500 per megalitre. People opted in at an average of about uh, $5,000 per megalitre, just above. Round two, it was just below $5,000 a megalitre, which was in part skewed by us not being able to take up those 29 reserve list projects. And that would have come out to a fairly similar, just above $5,000 per megalitre if they were included. And then you can see, as I said before, round three, we had very few applications come through, but they got by far the best value for money per project. What's great is in round four, uh, because we've managed the budgets uh, pretty well, um, that we've now got the $7,125 per megalitre available per project. And that's an average, uh, a project may wish to uh, put in a higher dollar per megalitre price, but that will reduce the competitiveness of that project because the value for money is a, a, a consideration in our competitiveness assessment. If obviously a project goes below the $7,125 per megalitre, then that is something that um, would increase the competitiveness of, of a proposal. So there is a lot of information on this slide, apologies, um, but it is available on our website. And as we said earlier, this um, video of this presentation will also be available on uh, the website, a link through from our site. Um, so please, if you need to revisit these slides, do so um, at any time through our website. But really what this is trying to say is that um, in order to participate, you need to be able to return water. And we call that eligible WAE, which is the eligible water access entitlement, which relates to those water access entitlements in the SA River Murray region, which are class three A and B, which are irrigation licenses, and then one, four and five, which are stock and domestic uh, recreation and industry water. So we'll accept any of those classes of water. So if you hold that water on license and um, you're able to return at least 10 megalitres is the minimum uh, to our program, then um, we're happy to, to fund, uh, to consider an expression of interest uh, for funding. We don't want to see people leaving the industry. We really want to uh, support those people wishing to stay in the industry. Um, and as you'd hopefully all be aware, we actually opened our expressions of interest on the 20th of March. And we do really want those projects to be completed within 18 months. But uh, we would prefer to receive an expression of interest that uh, states that they 
if they can't meet that target of being uh, project completion occurring within 18 months, would actually prefer to receive that expression of interest than to not. We'll use that as evidence um, that there are projects that will go over uh, the, the dates that we've got available. Obviously running around four uh, pushes us back in our program timeline. Um, and so please do submit if you are looking at going beyond 18 months, have a chat with your regional support officer or any of our staff and we would uh, encourage you to submit an expression of interest and put in a realistic timeline for completion. So irrigation efficiency stream one, uh, we need you to return at least 50% of your, uh, your water savings and the amount of water that you do return to us is considered in the competitiveness assessment. Um, that water in terms of the price, um, we've made it very clear in this round that we do have a set water price. Uh, we're saying that it's $2,850 per megalitre. Now the current market price has been just around, just below $3,000 per megalitre for the irrigation entitlements. That may come down over time. We won't reduce our price. Our price will remain at $2,850 per megalitre throughout this round. And um, you're able to uh, access up to 2.5 times that market rate if you do have um, genuine water savings through irrigation efficiencies activities. So that actually takes you up to our magic mark of $7,125 per megalitre that you can achieve entirely through Stream 1. We want those water access entitlements to be transferred through to um, our program by the end of 2017. So we'll be asking for those to occur in November, December of 2017. There's no water returns uh, Stream 2 funding available for this round. And Irrigation Industry Assistance Stream 3 is available but you must obviously be returning water in order to participate in uh, Stream 3, get access to that funding. And uh, the limitation is that you can access 50 cents of Stream 3 funding for every dollar that you're asking for through Stream 1. Now, um, that ultimately means that you can go above an average uh, price of $7,125 uh, per megalitre. Um, that's fine, you can go above that. We're giving people the ability to do that because it is a competitive process dollars per megalitre is not the only consideration that we have in the competitiveness process, and I'll go through that a bit more uh, down the track. And you'll see all the activities against these outlined within our guidelines. So we really do ask that you go and you have a look at our uh, program guidelines uh, for round four, which are available on the website. So um, a little bit of reiteration here, and I'll quickly flick over this. Um, we are really wanting to uh, just confirm and uh, reaffirm that the dollars per megalitre um, in terms of uh, stream three, you can achieve 50 cents out of every dollar being asked for through stream one. And we do really need to have eligible water access entitlement um, being returned to us, otherwise you can't participate. Um, your allocation, if you do return water entitlement, which is the permanent water to us, your allocation, which is the temporary water on an annual basis will be available to you as it has been in previous rounds for the rest of that water use year. So if you do return water to us in November of 2017, you'll be able to use the allocation uh, attributed to that entitlement right through until the rest of the financial year. So right through until June 2018. The expression of interest form, we normally go through that in the, um, the information sessions. We won't go through that today. If you do have any concerns around the expression of interest form, how to fill it out, um, there are a number of prompts throughout the expression of interest form, but our regional support officers will be able to help you in going through that. Um, and the links are available on our website to be able to access that expression of interest form. We also do have some USB devices that are um, required to submit additional information. So if you do submit a, um, an expression of interest or if you wish to, please do contact us on the numbers that are provided on our website and at the end of this presentation. Uh, we'll make sure that we get a USB sent out to you as well. That's to put some financial information on and to guide you. There's a whole bunch of fact sheets and the rest that are included. Um, just to help people uh, through our assessment process, if you're to get through, if we've got your financials up front, we can assess things quicker and time is of the essence in this final round of 3RP. So in terms of funding preferences, uh, we're really talking about the competitiveness elements now uh, of, of uh, of our round four. Um, we want to see as much water as possible within the given irrigation efficiencies that you can achieve. We do want to see some innovation. Um, 
with anything that goes into the stream three, we need to see that you're able to achieve some productivity gains. We wanna see your business doing better. Um, but the critical element that's been uh, used to assess um, throughout all of our rounds and will be in round four is the dollars per megalitre. So we're offering an average of $7,125 per megalitre in round four. The competitiveness of that proposal um, will be largely uh, considered through the dollars per megalitre that you do put against the amount of um, water you're returning. So if you go above $7,125 per megalitre, you become less competitive. If you go below it, you'll become more competitive. So that dollars per megalitre is important, but we really, really do want to see as much water being returned as possible from people in this final round. And we are very interested in making sure that there are productivity gains if you enter into our stream three irrigation industry assistance stream. So they're really the three main ones that we're focused on. It's the dollars per megalitre, the volume of water and the productivity gains. There is a process for each of the rounds that we have followed uh, to the letter uh, right throughout. Um, this is no different in round four. We want an expression of interest put in where we really do compliance checks is the main thing that we do in that space. Um, the compliance checks are about whether you fit the rules and those rules are outlined in uh, not only the uh, guidelines but also in the expression of interest form itself. Um, if you are then invited through uh, the uh, to the application stage, stage two, um, we will then have a much larger uh, form that will be presented to you, um, which will be asking for a whole bunch of um, business productivity, um, technically uh, sort of supported water savings information. Um, so we really do get down into the detail uh, around the application. And the reason why we do that is um, with the expression of interest, it's a really light on form. We want people to entertain the idea and sometimes entering can be just a big enough hurdle in itself. So we wanna help people to enter through a very simple expression of interest form. But then when we get to the application stage, um, you do have some time and I'll go through timelines in a tick um, to really consider what your proposal is in detail. When we get to the stage two assessment, we then take on the competitive ranking and that becomes critical around um, the business performance, the technical uh, feasibility, the, the amount of water saving and the, um, the value for money components in particular. If you get through that process, we'll send you a letter which says, would you like to sign up to an agreement? Hopefully everything works out well there and you, um, you can see the agreement um, which will ref be reflective of the milestones that you put into your application form. So we really do seek for people to put in uh, in their application form as accurate as possible milestones. You'll see that when you get to that stage, hopefully uh, you will do. Um, then we'll basically put that milestone table from the application form into a deed and send that out to you to, to consider. Sign that off and we start delivering and hopefully everyone's happy with the outcomes. And we are hearing some really good outcomes at the moment, which is fantastic from our round one, two and three projects. So the timeline, just to give you a sense, and this is getting very close to the end uh, of the presentation, we opened up the guidelines, uh, the round, so I released the guidelines, opened up the round in uh, March, 20th of March. Um, we are open to receive expressions of interest uh, for um, just over another week, on the 21st of April. We close our expressions of interest. The dotted lines here show that we take all of those expressions of interest and we consider them. Now, once we've finished our assessment and we want to get them done very quickly, we'll get back to you in May of 2017. Um, and you'll see that the red line at the top there, they're the ones who haven't progressed through. So they might not have hit the rules or the eligibility and compliance criteria, which as I've said, are very plainly explained in the guidelines and in the expression of interest form. So for those that do get through, we ask for them to submit an application and you'll have uh, around six weeks to complete that application and then we'll take those in for assessment. And once again, we'll do those assessments as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, so around uh, August, September, we'll get back to you with the outcomes and a letter of offer. And then we'll have in September, hopefully a funding agreement for you guys to consider. Um, and you'll see that uh, out of those, um, that some of those won't get through, which is the orange line. But for those green lines, the successful projects that do get through, we'll be asking for water to be returned as the first milestone, which is actually good because you get paid at that market rate of $2,850 per megalitre on return of the water to us, on transfer of the water to us. That means that you've got a bit of cash flow to get your project going. 
and then you get into milestone delivery and uh, hopefully we're all happy at the end and we have a, uh, a final report sent to us and you guys can reap the benefits. So uh, in terms of the way that we do our assessments, as I just restating, expression of interest is very much around the rules of eligibility and compliance. The application is really getting into our full checks on uh, all of the technical feasibility. Uh, we just see if you've varied at all from your expression of interest and we do run that competitiveness assessment over the top. So the EOI, we may have to consider dollars per megalitre in terms of competitiveness, but really it's about the rules. So that's a may. Uh, the application, we really do then look into the water savings, the dollars per megalitre, and in particular, the value of the production. Um, so those three elements, we do consider co-contribution. There is no requirement for co-contributions in terms of cash or in-kind co-contribution. Um, the three main elements there are dollars per megalitre, water savings, and the productivity elements. Our expert assessment panel and steering committee are the ones who really do all the work then in terms of making the decisions, recommendations through to the minister. So as a SARM pro, SARMS program, we take on all of the uh, applications. We help the expert assessment panel to understand those applications. They then put through recommendations and funding per project to the steering committee. The steering committee then look at those projects and rank them if we are oversubscribed. Uh, there'll be a threshold to which we can no longer fund because we would run out of money. Um, and then uh, they will recommend through the most competitive package to the minister for approval. And that's the same as it's occurred across all of the different rounds. For taxation, this has been something that's come up over the rounds. What's been good is the Australian government are now recognising uh, capital gains tax deductions on water facilities. The SARMS program and SA government uh, obviously do not provide tax advice, but do recommend that you seek independent legal and financial advice in entering into any grant because those tax consequences can vary uh, based on particular circumstances and from project to project. So please go and seek your advice and point out these uh, two websites, the fact sheet on SARMS 3RP and the capital gains tax um, deductions on water facilities to your advisors. We do have regional support officers available and are available right throughout the process. Now it's really important with the regional support officers that you understand that they cannot write the uh, funding proposal for you, your expression of interest or application. They can provide advice on the rules of the game, but they will not provide specific advice on how to position your project or any specific technical or business uh, advice. So they will help you though, understand the guidelines, understand what's eligible. Um, they'll be there not just uh, through the application period, but also once you're actually delivering your project, which is really important. They'll give you assistance right throughout that process to project completion. You'll see that these uh, details are available on the website um, and that we've split the region up in effect uh, above Wakeree across um, through the Riverland and then below Wakeree uh, down through to uh, the Lower Murray. So um, Brett Kennedy deals with the upper region, Tasha McGregor deals with the lower region and Kim Walton is their team leader who travels across the region and deals with uh, some of the more complex issues uh, at hand right across the region. So please do contact these guys. They are the best avenue to understanding the, the rules of the game. We'd really like to recognise the Water Industry Alliance um, and also recognise ISWARM, the International Centre of Excellence for Water Resource Management, providing great support to industry and to our programs going through. The Water Industry Alliance does provide access to service providers. Um, now, it's important that if applica applicants do wish to use a service provider to help prepare an application, you do this at your own risk and please be aware of um, any payments and any impacts that might have on your business uh, in um, contracting any service providers. But that is available for you through the Water Industry Alliance's website. Um, the Water Industry Alliance does not endorse any particular service providers. This is an open site, uh, which is the service that they're providing uh, through to you as the applicant. So our contact details there, um, the SARMS 3IP website is available uh, and please use it. The um, SARMS 3IP hotline of uh, 1300 364 322 will get you through to any of those regional support offices. So please have a look through to the website. Uh, please speak with our regional support officers and there are guidelines available. Make yourselves um, as familiar as possible with those guidelines because they really are the rules of the game. Thank you very much for listening.
Excellent. Thank you, Ben. Uh, it's Alice here again. Um, I'm just going to help manage the question part of today's webinar. Um, ben, we've already got a question come through on terminology. Um, one of our viewers wants to know, what are NPAs? <laughs> um, sorry, there's a lot of acronyms involved in all of this. An NPA is a National Partnership Agreement. It's an agreement that's signed between First Ministers. So that's a Premier of a state and a Prime Minister in most cases. Um, we've actually got a national partnership agreement agreed between our Premier and the Prime Minister of Australia um, to the $265 million sums program. They are available publicly. Uh, if you want to have a look at them, you can go to the Federal Financial Relations website. And basically, we have to run our program, a $265 million program, as a very large project. So we have milestones that are set out very clearly in the National Partnership Agreement, um, which we have to achieve. And we have to achieve those before we get our funding from the federal government. And um, within that National Partnership Agreement are the rules um, that have resulted in us not being able to use the Stream 1 funding uh, in Stream 2. So this is why we don't have Stream 2 funding available. So we, we're still working with the Commonwealth Government on creating a bit more flexibility under that National Partnership Agreement. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to get that realised um, for round four, but we will continue to work on that. So there you go, that's the long explanation of an NPA. Goodness, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ben. Um, and then we've just got some general questions around uh, regional support offices. So um, you've shared the contact details, which is excellent. So it's probably more a question around next steps and how to work with the, um, the regional support offices. Sure, so um, the best thing about our regional support officers is they've been doing this for a long time and they really understand the needs of industry. The best thing to do is just to contact them. They're very approachable. They're out in the region. You won't need to leave your property. If you want them to come and visit you, they will do that. Um, obviously, they're very busy at the moment. They've got a lot of people coming at them. They are um, keeping up with demand and we will throw more people that way if we do need to. Um, so please make a call, make an appointment, if you can possibly get into one of the offices, that might work. Uh, but over the phone is often enough. Um, and then if you do need a site visit, uh, they will entertain that um, based on what their availability is. Um, but they're not just available during the application period. If you are successful and you get through the application, uh, they actually come around and they help us with the monitoring of projects. They also help the uh, participants uh, if they come across any particular issues. So. They really are your one-stop shop uh, for anything 3RP. Excellent, great resource. Thank you, Ben. Um, just encourage also our viewers that you can still, um, got plenty of time to put questions in. Uh, we're, we're working through the list we've got, but we've got time to take your questions. So just use that Q&A button and uh, jot it down for us. Um, ben, uh, sort of a big picture question now. Uh, what happens if the program achieves more than 40 gig? Sure. So. Um, uh, amongst the many slides, there was one in there which had a big star kind of blowout on it, uh, which said uh, industry uh, will be, advice from industry will be sought, I can't remember what the wording was, if we go above 40 gigalitres. So our target is 40 gigalitres or 40 billion litres of water. We're currently at uh, 34.8 gigalitres of water, so we're very close. Um, if in the end round four, uh, results in an offering of more than the balance, which is 5.2 gigalitres. Um, we have always said that we'd go back to industry. Now we've got some avenues through industry. We've got our community and industry engagement reference group, as we like to call Surge. Um, so we've got that group that we'll go back to, and we do have other heads of industry, uh, including um, Armand Board, uh, Irrigation Trust, um, Chief Executives or Presiding Members. Um, we go back to those industry players before we take the next step on delivering any more than 40 gigalitres of water. In effect, if the response is, no, we don't go beyond the 40 gigalitres um, and we still have some cash at bank, uh, we will draw the line. And those people, unfortunately, who aren't as competitive as the rest uh, would be the ones who would miss out on that uh, specific funding opportunity. But if we do have any cash remaining, uh, the existing national partnership agreement recognises that the state then would be able to use that cash uh, to further the outcomes of the National Partnership Agreement and that would not require any further water to be 
uh, brought out from industry. So um, we will go back to industry first to have those discussions before we return any more than 40 gigawatts. Excellent. Thank you. And um, Ben, probably just give us a quick reminder of the closing date. Yeah, sure. Um, we've got the 21st of April is the closing date for expressions of interest. Uh, so that's only um, Friday week. It's not long away. Um, everyone's got an Easter that they could enjoy in the meantime and have ponder their expression of interest. What it means though is that even if you've got an expression of interest or a project idea which is 80% formulated, we'd suggest that you put it in. Because then in effect, you've got a number of weeks before we come back to you, if we invite you through an application to really keep working up the detail on that project proposal. So then you've got six weeks to complete an application form. So you actually do have a, a fair bit of time to really develop up the project idea. We wanna see an expression of interest at the idea stage at 80 odd percent. Um, we then, in terms of developing it through, uh, would want to see that that's well developed by the time you put in an application. So expressions of interest close on the 21st of April. Excellent, thanks Ben. I've just had one more question come in. Um, it's a question around um, switching crops. So um, sort of removing less profitable crops and therefore, um, I guess the impact on the water use. Um, and, and how is that considered um, as an application? Sure, so um, depends on the crop you've got and the crop you're going to. And in terms of water savings, um, we, if we see a crop, um, we get evidence from the applicant that there is a crop that the existing crop uses more water than the replacement crop, then there'll be a reduction in water use. And so we can consider that to be a water saving. So it would be in effect, um, the amount of water used per hectare. So for example, citrus, somewhere around nine megalitres per hectare. If someone wanted to pull out some citrus that uh, didn't have the right marketability, they wanted to go to a type of grape where they could see a market, then you go from six, uh, sorry, nine odd megalitres per hectare down to about six odd megalitres per hectare. So there'd be a water saving of three megalitres per hectare, times by however many hectares, that would be um, a water saving. We do have information sheets available online, uh, which point to the amount of uh, water savings that can be achieved through irrigation efficiencies. Um, we are happy to receive, um, so that would be the irrigation infrastructure, sorry. We are happy to receive other evidence of the amount of water use that a crop would use, going from high water use to low water use uh, in terms of a water saving. We also recognise that there are um, other crops that you might put in that could use more water, and we'll accept those under our stream three. So if you were to look at an existing crop and replacing that with a higher water use crop, we can entertain that as well, and we can use that on the productivity side of things, because in effect, you might your business might be better off um, producing, for example, almonds, as opposed to maybe the citrus that we were talking about. And the irrigation efficiency might be gained through replacement of inefficient irrigation infrastructure. So. To do this justice in a webinar is a little bit tricky. I would suggest that that person with that question goes and speaks to one of our regional support officers to speak about the specific details. But there's a bit of a, an overview. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Ben. Actually, it's good to know all that, um, that what are you starters available. Um, okay, so um, in terms of sort of broadening a, a business offering or diversifying, um, you know, what if someone wanted to, for example, move into um, accommodation or tourism or hospitality offerings. So switching from um, primary production of crops into something quite different again. Sure, there's a, a critical element within our offering is that we do not want to see people leaving the irrigation industry. So there have been previous programs that have um, and in very different times and, and perhaps suitable for the time uh, offered for people to exit the industry. We want people to stay. We want people to do better within the industry and we're talking the irrigation industry. So um, we can consider broad diversification elements of, um, of any business uh, enterprise. So if someone wants to go into uh, a different area, we can consider that. We have previously had proposals come through on tourism operations and the rest and they have not passed the litmus test because that was seen to be going into an area outside of the irrigation uh, industry. Um, but if there were uh, other activities which um, were linked to the irrigation industry, for example, there might be um, some uh, 
educational facilities and the rest that are developed up as part of an enterprise. Um, that's the kind of stuff that might be seen by our expert assessment panel and steering committee as being close enough to the irrigation industry. I think the point being, uh, through an expression of interest, if it's clearly articulated, it's better to, to throw your hat in the ring and to test us out. Uh, but it is important to have read the guidelines and understand that we do not want to, we will not be funding people who exit the irrigation industry. Excellent. Thank you, Ben. Um, so that's it for our question section. Um, and just to reiterate uh, the contact details so you can directly get in touch with the SAMS team uh, via the website. There's also a hotline. Um, and for um, people who are putting together their expressions of interest, there's a, a, a really great range of resources and support available. So we encourage you to explore those. Um, you can absolutely get in touch um, throughout the process of preparing your application. Um, so the, the SAMS teams are there to support you through this. Um, so any questions sort of that come up after this webinar, please get in touch.